hello facebook hi everybody hello how are you all doing um thanks for coming along and joining our live tonight we're going to be talking about all sorts of things i think we're going to go all over the place i have a feeling um so um please feel free to you know make comments ask questions um you know just general chat as we go along we're more We'd love to hear from you and hear what you've got to say as we're going on our conversation. Um, Joe's going to be managing the chat um, and we'll throw in the, co- the questions that you've got as we're going along. So that will be that'll be great. And so please feel free to ask anything as we as we do talk. We're talking obviously about self-care tonight and um, you know we've, we've been joined by Emma Mayer. Hi Emma. Yeah. I'm really excited to talk to you. So Emma is um, a female well, a health and well-being coach, but does actually work with with men as well. Um, so we're going to cover quite a bit of ground, I think, um, in the next half an hour or so. So Emma, do you want to kind of say a bit about what you do? When I asked this of Emma before we came on live, there's literally an A4 sheet, so this could take up the whole half an hour. But <laughs> um, but just tell us a bit about what you do, and you've got your own business, haven't you? Uh, called Inspired Movement and um, Massage as well. So. Yeah, give us an idea. Yeah, well, I originally started out as M5 Fitness because I was a PT and that's how I started off. Mm. And it was only really as my client base changed that I started to learn more, but want to learn more. And that pushed my education. Um, and there were a few other factors that made me want to drive my education the way it did. But basically, I'm a women's wellness coach, so that encompasses all fitness from general fitness, pregnancy, all the way through to postnatal, menopause. Um, I also work with women who have hysterectomies, breast cancer, um, and I do sports massage. So it encompasses quite a big area, um, and there's lots of separate qualifications within that, but that's the gist of kind of what I do. And Mm. I love helping people develop and grow and heal from injury and learn about themselves because most of us don't know anything about our own bodies if we're walking around and doing what we do every day, but we haven't got a clue about them. <laughs> we don't do anything about it when it all goes wrong. I was just going to say that, actually. You become very interested when you think, why is this not working properly? What's happening? <laughs> What's going on? And your body has probably been telling you for a year or two years, hello, do something. Yeah. And, and I see that in mental health, you know, working as a fortis and all the different people we help and support. Often our bodies physically start to show us there's something wrong. And that can be very much connected to what, how we're doing mentally. But we're really probably not taking that on board very easily. So our bodies, all, it stops us. And we see it all the time when people go on holiday or suddenly they've become ill having survived, you know, working or whatever it might be. But your body will let you know, won't it? This is something that's not quite right. Absolutely. And and something that um, I wrote a few articles for Bear Biology, um, and, and a couple of those articles were based around pain and how we store pain in our bodies and how that can affect us, and whether that can be from physical pain or emotional pain in, in with what you deal with, trauma, but they all have, you know, a, an effect on each other. And, you know, you could do something as simple as go to a festival and spend three, four hours sat on a concrete floor, for example, and then two, three years later, the woman had problems with your pelvic floor. Mm. And you're like, I don't understand what's happened. And that's how interconnected we, we are with mm. everything, with our mind, mm. our body. And I deal with quite a lot of different aspects of that. So, yeah, I just think the, the human body is fascinating. But, yeah, I, I find certain areas in particular quite interesting. Do you do you find that you kind of when you when you when you're working with somebody that you're almost kind of I was just thinking there it's like a bit almost investigating what might have happened and what might have led to where the person is now and how they're feeling or what's happening to them in terms of their physicality? Yeah, because I I because of what I'm qualified in, so whether it be someone coming to me with an issue to do with backache, let's say, um, mm. or it's very specific like to do with breast cancer or they're coming for a cesarean scar and they're struggling with abdominal pain, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, for me, I don't see, I think uh, not all therapists, but some therapists can get stuck. And this is only based on what they've been taught. So it's not, not that anyone's at fault, but seeing a box in the box. And for me, I think my education has allowed me to see outside of that. Mm-hmm. So I ask 
probably more questions and look at different ways of addressing maybe someone's backache that they can say, well, I've been to osteopath for six years, um, I've been to physio, I don't understand why I'm still in pain with my back. And then it turns out that, well, actually, 44 years ago, you had your last child, you've got separation of the stomach muscle. What mm. still? Yeah, postnatal means postnatal. So after you've had a baby, you're always postnatal. So irrespective of how long ago that was, the body hasn't been fit. So how would that magically just sort itself? It doesn't just go away. And all of a sudden you just see this like aha moment with them and go, oh sorry, I swear on you. Like for sake, I've paid, I've paid how much money seeing all these people and that's what's wrong. And it's not because I can't help everyone and there's lots of people that I go, look, I'm not the person for you. We mm -hmm. need to find someone else. But I think what my education has allowed me to do is to see outside of that box mm -hmm. and to kind of probe it in a different way that will help me get to the bottom of it. I was just thinking as you were saying that years ago, I, I mean, part of the reason I became a therapist was because I had a, um, you know, really bad experiences of therapy and I had a really bad car accident where I was diagnosed with PTSD. And um, one of something happened a few years later, I, you know, I'd started training to be a therapist and I was kind of figuring out my own self and having lots of therapy myself. And I had a near miss car accident. And on my way to my supervision, actually, and I got to my supervisor's house. I was quite shaken up because uh, I was having some flashbacks and things. And um, I sat down and my, I'd injured my left leg in my accident. And what I'd found, I sat down and my left, my left foot was completely turned in. My leg, it was almost like my body reacted yeah. to what had just happened mentally. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, it was it was fascinating, really, just to experience that. It wasn't nice, but it was almost like my body's communicating. Actually, that I found that really difficult. What's just happened has been really tough, but it's almost like a somatic response. Like the body holds those memories and and acts them out sometimes. I think. Do you see that in your practice? Yeah, and and it's funny you say that because I saw Joe's reaction. I um I had quite a bad car accident myself two years ago, and for me on a personal level it hit me more than I thought it was ever going to. It was a very bad accident. I got rear-ended and um, completely wrote my car off. And although my physical injuries weren't probably as bad as they could have been, I ended up in therapy for over six months because it brought back so many locked away trauma. I grew up in care, basically, in the short, um, from my past that I couldn't even remember. And I was just flooded with all this trauma and pain and what is going on why am i remembering these things and feeling these things and that absolutely hands on heart it's helped me with so many clients when it comes to unlocking pain and how their body deals with it so from that side obviously mm -hmm. i always recommend my therapist and say this is one of many i'm sure you can go and talk to but in terms <laughs> of your body you've got to remember that if a woman has been through a traumatic labor, as an example, and she's holding on to a lot of trauma in her body, she can not even look at that cesarean scar. She's so traumatized because she, she didn't plan for it. And it's mm. amazing how that is something that can you can hold on as a loss, and that's a grief. Mm. So yes, I, I, I get a lot of clients that are going through maybe those types of experiences. And it, it's just fascinating how your body, sorry, I tend to, to go off on a little side, but no. it's amazing how your body stores that pain and how it comes out. Yeah. I was just thinking that we were talking actually to Leon Lloyd, um, who's a, a former England rugby player, just a, a, a bit ago in the Westerly Club. And we were talking just about this, that, that where you mentally expect yourself to go and then suddenly where you actually go can be can be that can be quite difficult because like you were just saying there about childbirth or um you know and it hasn't gone the way you expected it to it's been a traumatic birth and you know even things like writing your birthing plan about what exactly you want to happen and not managing to get that by getting something that actually that's you know probably a lot more complex and more difficult than that um it leaves it can leave women in that place of feeling 
that they should be getting over it and they should get on with it. And actually, you know, yes, that was what you wanted, but this is what you got and you've got to keep going. But actually, all of that is loss, isn't it? The loss of the expectation, the plan, everything else. It's amazing how many women go through that and they're afraid to talk about it because they feel stupid. Because, well, I've got a healthy baby. Everything went okay still, but they're actually grieving that loss of their expectation of what they wanted. And then that stops them from coming to terms really with a loss of how they should be dealing with their body. And they're not dealing with their body because they haven't processed that loss first. And that's just one example of many, you know, we, yeah, the, 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 the brain, the body, everything. We, we underestimate how much it has an effect on us. Yeah, absolutely. How much is all connected as well, I think. Mm. So you talked there a little bit about that, the accident that you had and the kind of process you've then gone through. Um, was that, did that really surprise you that that was something that triggered, you know, obviously you, you obviously went for therapy and had a good experience of that. Was it something that really kind of surprised you that you had that unresolved stuff, if you like, that was, that was still there? Yeah, because I think more for me, I've always, anyone who knows me will always say, you're a really strong person and you know, you're always looking out for the people, you're always quite outgoing, etc. I've never felt not strong. I've always felt strong and I've always thought I was in control. So to be in a position where I was out of control and then all of a sudden flooded with all these feelings, memories and emotions that I had to piece together and work through was very painful for me. I'm not someone who normally cries easily. Um, you know, I'm normally someone that will be there for everyone to then have to admit that I'm struggling now mm. and to cry in front of someone I don't know and to talk about it and try and piece that together, that was very difficult. Mm. The outside or the, the end of that process is, my partner says I cry all the time now. <laughs> so every sad advert and, and movie, apparently I've got tears, including Star Trek, and he'll be like, oh God, you're going to cry. <laughs> Oh my god, it's devastating. So I've gone from one end to the other. But I I needed to go through that because no one is in control all the time. And no. that's a very big wake up call for me. No one is in control all the time. And this epidemic we've been through has just proven that. Yeah. And it took me from realizing that everything I was doing, so I've I've exercised since I was 16. It's the first time I hadn't exercised. I didn't exercise for a year and a half. I physically couldn't do anything because I was just so, I'd got it in my head. I was more injured than I was. Mm. And I'd allowed pain in my body to take over what my brain knew was actually good for me. Mm. So when the first lockdown happened, I literally said, fuck it, I'm going to start exercising. So I decided to do a live training group to make myself do it. And I haven't done anything for nearly a year and a half two years mm. so that was tough <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but, but I needed it and it made me accountable and mm. I think probably the biggest takeaway from that we always start somewhere and we're always too hard on ourselves we're our worst critics we judge ourselves too much and sometimes you just need to do it not knowing what the outcome is going to be no, I, I have a, the way I, I go at that um, is that your head will catch up, you know, so, you, you know, you might kind of think I can't do it. I don't want to do it. You can talk yourself out of anything, can't you? Because you say that that inner self-talk is our own. We're, we are our own worst enemy at times. We can be our, I can be our own best cheerleader, but we can also be the person who undermines ourselves the most. And I think sometimes it's just acknowledging that your head doesn't want to but actually you'll feel better for doing it and it'll catch up and it does catch up doesn't it if, if you take exercise as an example about 20 minutes in suddenly the endorphins are starting to kick in and you start to feel like actually this this was a good thing to do yeah well, this, mm. it, at first i needed to do it and now i choose to do it again and mm. i enjoy it and i feel happier again and it's not just exercise but there's so many things that i've done for my own self-care that I would never have given myself time to do before. And mm. it, it's just interesting being, I'm in my forties to now be in this position where I'm going, I'm just learning how to look after myself. Mm. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's when we learn, that's the point I'm making. It's like you're ready to start whenever you're ready to start. Mm. Mm. Whenever you're ready to start, you've just got to start. Mm. Yeah, it's just making that first that first small step forward, isn't it, into something that helps. When did you did you before you kind of had this flooding of all these different kind of uh, feelings? Did you look after yourself very well before, or were you kind of um, distracted from yourself? Do you know what I mean? Like was life busy and full of different things that you were doing, so you weren't centre stage, or did you were you already quite good at that? I think I've always been very good at paying lip service and self-care in the sense that I ate well, I exercise, um, I thought I was really happy, but I think I was an expert at helping everyone before myself. <laughs> and I was so good at doing that, so good, and I can read most people, I, I, you know, it's like I get clients that say, I don't know how we've got onto this conversation, but this has really helped me. And I managed to pull things out of people in a good way, but that's because mm -hmm. I got so good and so expert at helping other people. It finally made me go, okay, I have to now look at me. And at mm -hmm. first I was confused as to, well, there's, there's nothing wrong. I don't understand. It's just a car crash. I don't, you know, I don't know why I'm feeling like this. But it, yeah, it totally rocked the foundations of everything I'd built myself upon up until. Mm -hmm. I was 40. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I know just, I know my different, I was 19, but I know it massively affected my identity. I, I kind of, you know, the world was for the taking and I didn't have any fears of anything really, because at that age, I hadn't really ex experienced anything that was, that put me in that position. But as soon as that happened, it was very different. And I had to recognize that actually, having gone through that experience and the process that I had to go through afterwards, physically and mentally, that my identity needed to change and, I, and it did change just because of my experience. You can't unlearn it, can you? Once you know all that um, and having gone through therapy myself, you know, once, I, once I've learned all of that, those things, I can't unlearn them. So you then really kind of um, have a responsibility to do something with what you've learned about yourself, I think. Yeah, definitely. And it made me realise why I've done some of the things that I've done. And it, mm -hmm. as an example, why I've done so many qualifications over the years because I've always had this expectation that I would feel I was like, I've made it, and I'm, I'm full of knowledge and I can help everyone. And every time I did a course and kind of absorbed as much as I could and helped some people, I was like, I just don't feel it yet. So mm -hmm. then I'd go and do another one. And I'm, I have been a magpie for courses. I've 12. 13 qualifications because I just felt everyone was going to give me that tip that made me go, ah, you know, yeah. no. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. until my therapist said, um, yeah, I have a bit of an issue with imposter syndrome, that maybe you need to realize that uh, something bigger is going on here. Yeah. <laughs> like, ah. And it's only now, really, that validation. Is actually now coming for how hard I've worked, how much money I've spent, and the time I put into my education. That only now am I starting to feel that. Yeah, yeah, connect with that. Yeah, which is bonkers because mm. anyone would say, "Well, that's ridiculous." You do know. Yeah, well, I never felt that. Yeah, but that, I think that's. I think a lot. A lot of people will be able to relate to that. You know, that feeling of almost trying to fill that void with with knowledge or justification or achievement or attainment whatever it might be that it's almost like a, it's like a black hole though isn't it if you don't connect with actually what you're doing and believe that you can do this then all of those things don't actually give you that confidence it's just another certificate on the wall if you like yeah and and, and that's probably part of the way that i haven't showcased maybe enough of what i do um mm because I've never maybe had enough of that self-belief and it's what mm -hmm. I teach all the time. You know, girls practice what you preach. It's like now it's sinking in. Um, so with, with the most latest lockdown, this longer period, I took a complete break from social media. I decided I'm just going to step away. Um, you know, talk to everyone I still need to talk to and my clients can still message me. But I decided what was going to be good for me was to put 
ourselves first in this one. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about self-care, and that's literally all I've done for this last lockdown. I've just decided to connect better with myself, um, take my time to just stick my head back in the books and refresh anything I need to. I've done more jigsaws than I care to remember. My garden has been transformed. I've learned how to upholster. <laughs> but it's like, trust me, I've got mad skills now in loads of different areas. But it's it's just it's been fun exploring a different side of myself and not always pressurizing pressurizing myself to achieve. It's it's interesting. I was just thinking about that development that you've gone through there. It's almost like you've you've tried tried out things that you actually want to do. You know that. Like the gardening and the upholstering and you know things that actually you probably could have gone through your life without actually ever engaging with even trying those ideas i've learned how to make lampshades i've upholstered my sofa i've put <laughs> pom-poms on anything i can friggin pom-pom trust me my partner comes home and he's like fuck sake why have you pom-pom the light shade and i'm like yeah. why not i've spray painted my wicker table neon pink <laughs> Really great time. <laughs> yeah, loved it. And like I honestly, I have seen this time as such a huge learning curve in me. Mm. And that's what I've taken it as. It mm. it's been a real amazing opportunity to get to know me. Mm. And I think a lot of men and women alike, we can go through being something for someone else for so much mm. of our lives that we don't know who we are and what we mm. want mm. and that's been yeah it's been it's been wonderful it has it's been hard don't get me wrong and i've spent most days on my own because my heart has still been working the whole time but i wouldn't have changed what we've just been through mm. because it's been a huge learning curve in a positive way for me. <laughs> I think it i think it takes quite a lot of courage to use that time to focus on you because sometimes we don't like ourselves that much. Sometimes we might not like parts of ourselves and, and actually being able to create that space to, because I was just thinking there that you've been, it's like working on acceptance, isn't it? That you've kind of gone from that, that, you know, maybe some of that imposter syndrome, maybe that was there. And then now kind of accepting you and being with you and that being, and you being good enough as well. Because I think that's also part of it, isn't it? That, is that if that inner critic's quiet and down and if you've realized what helps you from a self-care perspective as well you've always got those tools in your toolkit that you know will ground you and help you and create that headspace for you well it's just i think i've always been terrible for feeling guilty for doing anything for myself mm. um and i think that's something that most people can relate to whether it be that you just stick the tv on and you want to binge on something or you want to stay in a bath for two hours till you go all wrinkly or you just want to do some gut whatever it is spending spend five hours doing a jigsaw puzzle like what the actual what, five hours doing a jigsaw puzzle however what i will say from that is that did feel indulgent and naughty i didn't feel guilty it's the first time i've actually gone yeah of course i've done that why would i not do that and i never would have thought like that I've always been like, oh my God, I've got, right, I need to run around the house and clean up now to look like I've done loads. Because what have I done? I've just watched Netflix for five hours. <laughs> no, I've come in and, you know, my son has come in and I, nothing's clean or I've done the dinner. I've gone, yeah, just chilled out today. And I never would have done that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, Joe knows. <laughs> Joe wow, knows. you've changed. <laughs> Girl, you change. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. The house is obsessively high. I'm still neurotic, but yeah. <laughs> a healthy balance I've never had. I've never had. Yeah. No, no, we've got some good questions. That's all. Yeah. Um, so this is from a chap. Um, I currently see prize several ladies who need some extra motivation around nutrition as they have unhealthy lifestyles whilst at work. What would you suggest and how do I broach the situation as I want to be sensitive and not offend anyone? Okay. Well, so in terms of so, so what you mean, like a nutrition plan or? 
It just, it's some extra motivation around nutrition, approaching a more healthy lifestyle while they're at work. Well, the thing is that people set themselves too big a goal in terms of nutrition. So for example, you can go and speak to someone maybe about a nutrition plan, and this is my biggest bugbear in the fitness industry, and they'll write out this massive plan of about 15 meals a day that you have to adhere to that just consists of like broccoli and chicken every 2.3 hours. If you want success, make it fit to your lifestyle. So if you have a busy lifestyle and you can't eat very often, so some of my clients are nurses as an example, well, you can guarantee at the minute they're not getting many meal times. So I tell them to make smoothies or to make shakes. Whatever can get their calorie quantity, make sure it's nutritionally packed in an easy to manage dose. So if you've got someone who works on an in an office and something that might be an issue is people bring in snacks, find out who that person is and say that's not helping. <laughs> it's a feeder. It's also you know, it's a have a look at their schedule, you know, how they're working, but make it fit their needs. So just make suggestions of things that will fit. Mm. You don't take on more than they can do. Mm. Yeah. I hope that's the right. And I think as well, make it a team thing, you know. So if you're having conversations about that, I know when I, you know, teams that I work in, you know, if you're having a conversation about that and you're actually you're making a concerted effort and doing it together, it's much easier, isn't it, than if you're just doing it on your own, I think. Yeah. I mean, you can even form like a little group, whether it be on Facebook, take pictures of recipes, your favorite recipes, anything. Take mm. turns at making lunch for each other, make it fun. There's, there's lots of ways that you can approach it, but most of all, it has to fit with their lifestyle. Because if you're busy, then you, you're guaranteed that there's going to be fairly good do it. something quick that's going to hit the spot. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. um, and then another, why do you think that as women, or why do you think that women find it so hard to put themselves first? Because we're always there for other people. Because whether we, and I'm so pro-women, it's unreal, so trust me, but I still want to do things to help my partner. And that, whether it's ingrained in me, I don't know, but that's just as women, we always want to be a caretaker, generally for someone else. And we're always the bottom of the pile because we always think we need to be busy. We need to be doing stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. And taking that time to just stop and acknowledge that, actually we can come first is mortifying for most women they couldn't think of anything worse they'll be adamant they do it but they don't mm. we're just permanent caretakers and it's not until we realize that that things will change yeah well it leads into another question actually say as a mum of boys my husband and I try very hard to be equal but I'm awful at slipping into being the natural one to go to the bottom of the list do you think there are ways to train our children girls and boys to break the cycle yeah, absolutely. And I think as parents, we're there to be role models, aren't we? And as much as that is that he, your partner, will probably do his best to help out, etc. If you're always going to step in and do something because it will be done better or quicker, then that will never change. So sometimes you have to accept that maybe a job that's not up to your standard is still a job done. Yeah, I think you, I think it's recognising you have to let go. I think you know that's part of it, and and it is that balance that in a relationship that you know if your children are, are watching that and they're learning from it, and it is it is about that balance. And the communication comes in with that, doesn't it? That you know how are you talking to each other about those things, and who's taking responsibility for what? And you know, there's um, I was talking to somebody recently, a friend of mine, and she was talking about blue jobs and pink jobs. And, and I was thinking that that's fine, but they were categorized, you know, it was basically categorizing what you would traditionally see as a blue job and a pink job, um, which isn't necessarily what they wanted in the family or how they wanted the family to work. So trying to think about the language you use around things as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But this, this, this something that popped into my head is a really good, um, she's a relationship and sexual health therapist called Esther Farrell. And yeah. I love everything yeah. she does. And one of, one of the things that she talks about is pick your battle. Some things you have to just let slide. They might rip your shit. You might want to go screaming at him that you want him to do it this way, want him to pick this up. But sometimes you have to accept that if him may be leaving his shoes or her, 
in that corner means that something else gets done and you just have to carry on and just move it so the other jobs get done and do it. But sometimes mm. it is picking your battle. Yes, completely. Yeah. Mm. Um, just following on from the nutrition one earlier, um, the chap saying... Um, that sometimes he feels like he's treading on eggshells, but doesn't want to come across as uncaring, particularly as a couple of officers that he works with are um, menopausal. Um, obviously he's a bloke and feels like he doesn't know what he's talking about. So he is actively trying to figure out ways to help them in the workplace. Well, what I can say on that point then, if it's menopausal, trust me, anything you say may be taken the wrong way because when you're feeling that way, that's the way it is, meno rage, is how it can be referred to, trust me. But not all women are like that. It's not how it is. It's just a misconception. However, what I can say is that I can, um, if, if you can get him to maybe drop me a message or you can share my email address, I can give you like 10 top things that you should be eating if you're going through the menopause. They can even contact me. Um, it does help to eat slightly differently. How we've been educated as women all of our lives is that we should, well, we, women go through their lives, let me kind of condense this down, yo-yo dieting, and mm. constantly eating cardio, especially when they're younger, trying to be as skinny as they can. And as you get older, you have to completely change how you think about exercise and how you think about food. Because what you've always done won't work when your hormones change. It's mm. as simple as that. And if you want strategies that work, well, that's why I have studied in the courses that I have to be able to help women going through that and men with their partners go through that. But yeah, you, 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 just, you need to eat differently anyway, which will help massively. Mm. So it's probably a subject that might be easier for a woman to broach. Yeah, of course. I've just said, Emma, in the um, comments about the link to the questionnaire that you're going to send us. Yeah. Um, so I'll once we've got it, I'll post it in the comments. I've just said to, the, to everyone watching and those that are going to follow up, um, I'll put it in the comments at the bottom. So if anyone wants to click through, you just said it's a couple of tick boxes, didn't you? And you yeah, and it can be anything. The questions I'll put in might be, you know, do you want to know more about nutrition, hormones, sleep, hot flushes, strategies, whatever. Yeah. Amazing. Brilliant. Is there any other questions, Joe? before we think of it? Let me just check. I think that was all of them, actually. <laughs> Like no, that was all of them. In the background. <laughs> <laughs> we need the sound. That's what we need. No, we've covered them all. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Emma, it's been fantastic to talk to you. Thanks ever so much for coming along to talk to us tonight. And thank you for the, that offer as well about supporting people and, you know, directing them with some information as well. I think that would be, I think you'll probably have quite a few takers for that. Um, if people want to follow you on social media and, you know, uh, where are you? What's the name of the pages? Yeah, well, I'll, I can um, pop it under under the comments for you. And yeah. Um, yeah, there's been nothing posted on there since Christmas because I took a break, but um, I'm looking to start posting again in April. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so people can contact me. Um, mm. I'm still active on them, just not posting on there at the minute. Okay. We're all bombarded enough with stuff. We don't need me on there as well. Yeah, to be honest, I think 40s are doing it for everyone at the minute. We've, we've got stuff going on all the time, so... <laughs> yeah, it's good, it's good. It's, um, I've enjoyed having a break, to be honest, because I'm normally so like, busy on there. Yeah. But, yeah, it's been nice. But yeah, if anyone wants to message me, and it can be about anything, because, yeah, I'll answer yeah. it if I can. I think that, that's fab and I think it's a really good message as well that just because you're not active on social media doesn't mean to say you're not around it's, it's yeah, just around. as well yeah absolutely thanks so much. <laughs> yeah well do you know I was just thinking I was talking to somebody um, the other day he runs his own business and he sent me he sent me a message on LinkedIn actually saying um, me and my wife have got into doing jigsaw puzzles more than I ever thought possible <laughs> please don't tell anyone <laughs> well I think I've set myself up here because my next one it's um you know where's Wally yes it's where's Bowie where's David Bowie amazing and I'm like I can see myself still in six years doing the same puzzle <laughs> Right, it's been lovely to talk to you, Emma. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone on Facebook. Thanks for your comments and, 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 and uh, interaction. And we'll see you next week. Take care, everybody. Bye.
Bye. Bye.